Hi, I'm Larry King, and you're watching Coping with COVID, a special series brought to you by PositiveVoices.com and the International Positive Psychology Association. My co-host is Dr. James Powelski, professor of practice at the University of Pennsylvania Positive Psychology Center and founding executive director of the International Positive Psychology Association. And today, we're interviewing Dr. Ken Parkman, a world authority on the impact of spirituality in people's lives. For over 40 years, he has studied the role of religion in helping people cope with stress and trauma. Welcome to the show, Ken. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, what, what got you interested in studying spirituality, and will you define it for me? Uh, sure. Um, I guess like many young psychologists, I, I went into the field because I was struggling with big questions. Um, what makes people tick? Um, how can we help people who are having problems and suffering? How do we make the world a better place? And I only half jokingly say that my first client was a five pound pigeon um, because at that time when I was in graduate school, the major uh, orientation or paradigm was behaviorism. So I worked with my pigeon and, and learned about principles of reinforcement. That was all very useful, but my pigeon didn't have any, didn't have much to say about the big questions. So I started reading about religion and spirituality, and even though I didn't, I was certainly not a theologian, I found that people who were um, religious and spiritual were often dealing with the same questions I was. Why are we here? What's the purpose of it all? How do we live a good life? And uh, I started doing research on it and got hooked. And then I started to integrate it more into my own uh, clinical yeah. practice as well. Did you become religious? Um, well, I was uh, raised in a conservative Jew in Washington, D.C., and it was always an important part and is an important part of who I am, but I, I wasn't sure why. And so part of my interest was quite personal in this, and so I started to uh, go to different churches and mosques and synagogues and talk to people, and in the process, I found that um, I learned a lot about other traditions, and it it didn't uh, damage my own orientation. It really strengthened my own religious orientation. I learned a lot from other traditions. Isn't it, uh, to those of us who are not believers, isn't it basically a crutch? Well, I think it can be for some, but I think for most people, it's, a, it's a really a way of trying to reach out to something beyond themselves. I think people are not only psychological, social, and physical beings, we're spiritual beings as well. And I think spirituality grows out of this basic yearning for a relationship with something transcendent, something larger than themselves, call it something sacred. Now that doesn't have to be God or a higher power. We can find other aspects of life sacred. We can find parenting sacred, nature sacred, our work can become a vocation. Um, uh, marriage can be seen as sacred. So all of these things are, um, sacred objects. And really what I think spirituality is about, it's about trying to discover and hold on to, and at times transform a relationship with whatever we may hold sacred. I don't think that's just a crutch. I think it's a basic hardwired um, capacity in human nature. James? So Ken, Sorry, Larry, I was just gonna ask Ken, by the way, it's great to see you, uh, Larry, and uh, uh, it's great to see you as well. Ken, this is a really important uh, discussion. I wonder if you could say just one thing more, Ken, about your sense of the connection between, or the difference between religion and spirituality. Well, I think in some way, well, the, the two concepts, spirituality and religion, are somewhat different, but they also overlap. Uh, spirituality, if we think of it as what we do to form and hold on to a relationship with something sacred, that's really the central function of organized religious life. I mean, that's what religions are supposed to do, is to encourage people to develop and form a relationship and maintain a relationship with whatever uh, is held sacred. But having said that, you don't have to be part of an organized religious system to seek out the sacred. People can do it in other contexts. People can do it in nature. They can do it through their work. They can do it through loving relationships. So we can find the sacred in many areas of life, 
uh, including organized religious institutions, but not limited to those. Does it, does it matter to someone's mental health? Well, it looks like, um, I mean, that's a great question. And in the last uh, 30 years, literally hundreds of studies have been done showing that there are benefits to mental health for people who are uh, more deeply uh, religiously involved. But having said that, it's also the case that we can find religious and spiritual expressions that can be um, more harmful. In some ways, religion is a double-edged sword. It can bring out the best in people and it can bring out the worst. So Ken, we're talking about coping with COVID. So can you tell us a little bit about the connection between spirituality uh, and uh, the coronavirus and our attempts to deal with it? Well, we know there's a, a close connection between times of stress and, and uh, religion and spirituality. They say there are no um, atheists and foxholes. Uh, actually, that's an overstatement. We can find atheists and foxholes. But there is this general tendency for uh, difficult times of life to bring out that spiritual impulse. In, in following 9-11, 90% of people in the United States uh, uh, look to God for support. Um, some recent work on COVID-19 has shown that in, in March of just this year, um, as the number of cases of COVID-19 uh, COVID increased, there was a dramatic increase in the number of Google searches uh, for prayer. And that, that was found across 75 countries. Um, so there's a, a pretty clear link between um, major life crises and uh, turning to spirituality and religion for help in coping. And I, that certainly applies to COVID-19. And, and you talk about spirituality and coping in times, you know, when things can be, can seem to be going all wrong. I've heard you talk about the Japanese art form of kintsugi. Could you tell us about that and how that connects to your view of spirituality? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that, that spirituality is really a, uh, a, resor a resource that complements our traditional orientation to problems in the U.S. Our the U.S. culture is very um, a control and mastery oriented. Uh, we learn to solve problems ourselves. Uh, we learn to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We learn to take control. But it's also the case that major problems in life have an uncontrollable aspect. Uh, not every problem is solvable. And many problems uh, are just fraught with uncertainty. And that's certainly the, tr the case for COVID-19. Uh, we can't see the virus, so we can't avoid it. When we get sick, we can't control the course of the illness. So we're faced with the uncertainty of how serious the illness will be and whether we will in fact be able to survive it. So this is a, a kind of crisis that calls for not just mastery and problem solving, but help in coming to terms with human limitations, with our frailty, with our, our finitude. And that's where spirituality offers, I think, very powerful resources. And one of those is helping people see more deeply into pain and suffering. From a spiritual point of view, um, there's a deeper dimension to life. It's a way of seeing life more deeply. And that includes seeing into pain and suffering. From a spiritual point of view, there may be more to pain and suffering that meets the eye. And they may not have the last word. Uh, in the, recently, we just celebrated uh, Passover. And in the Passover story, we hear the, the uh, promise of liberation from slavery. And in the Easter message, we hear hope of redemption. Um, you mentioned uh, Kintsugi, James. It's another beautiful example of of hope, and it's based on a uh, art form uh, that's about 600 years old, and it involves uh, the breaking of a piece of pottery or ceramics, and then piecing it together with gold or silver filigree. And the end result is oftentimes a beautiful work of art, more beautiful, I'd say, than the original unbroken piece. And there's a wonderfully hopeful message in this art form. And the, the message is that 
yeah, we can all be broken to some extent, but we can also rebuild the pieces of our lives in ways that make our lives a, a beautiful work of art. So out of brokenness can grow wholeness. And, and I think it's a, a very timely message for people who are certainly feeling things breaking right down in, in their lives right now. Do you see any downside to spirituality now? Yes. Uh, again, it's a double-sided uh, coin. And some expressions of religion and spirituality can be downright destructive. Um, and just to give a few examples, one, one example is when we defer all the responsibility to God in situations that do call for uh, human e effort. You know, uh, you may have read the story about the minister who was asked how he's dealing with COVID-19, how he's staying safe. And he said, well, he doesn't need to do anything because God is his sanitizer. So that's, that's quite uh, a problem. And I think another example is um, when we may hold a small view of God. So we may see a God who, or believe in a God who loves and cares for only the people who believe the same things we do. And people who fall outside that religious umbrella can be treated with, uh, um, with skepticism, they can be mistreated, they can be scapegoated. And, and one other problem is the fact that uh, major crises like uh, coronavirus impact people spiritually as well as psychologically, socially, and physically. And people can have their, their whole orientation to life, their most fundamental beliefs thrown into confusion. They can be shaken to the core. And so we can struggle with God. We can struggle about whether our beliefs are in fact true. Um, we can struggle morally to live with, with our deepest values. That's I'm hearing so many stories of that among healthcare professionals who have to make these terrible moral choices of who's going to live and who's going to die. And those are, those are terrible kinds of positions to be in and they leave us with fundamental questions and doubts and struggles about sacred matters. And these struggles have been tied to declines in mental health, physical health. And so it is important to be able to talk about them and find support for struggles that people experience spiritually. I think that's going to be a major issue in, in days, months, and even years to come. So Ken, piggybacking on that and thinking about the, the healthy side of spirituality, what can we do in these times to increase and, and cultivate our spirituality? Well, I, being a, a clinical psychologist, I often respond to questions with questions. <laughs> so these are some questions that I think are, are good to consider if we want to kind of just have some tips for enhancing spirituality in daily life. And I think one thing to do is ask yourself, consider what do you hold sacred? I mean, we're on our own a lot. We're isolated in, in our, own, our own, we're hunkered down, but this is a chance to do some soul searching. So why don't we use this time to consider what are we most deeply devoted in our lives and how much are we able to put our time and energy into the things that matter the most to us? This could be a way and a time to kind of realign our, our actions with what really matters. I think another question would be, okay, well, where do you find the sacred? Do you find it through prayer or meditation? Do you find it through reading? Do you find it through loving relationships? Um, where is the place that you experience these powerful emotion is so tied to spirituality of gratitude and awe and love and wonder. These emotions are often uh, uh, an important clue about what you hold sacred and where you might try to spend more of your time. So those are just a couple of things to, to, to you know, consider using, using this time to enhance our own spirituality. What do you say to people during these times about loss? Uh, people who've lost loved ones to this virus. What do you say to them on how that deals with spirituality, loss? That is such an important question, Larry. And I think it's a, an especially important question now because co the coronavirus has affected us not only through these terrible losses, 
but through our ability to uh, mourn. And the religions of the world have developed some really remarkable mourning rituals that acknowledge the, the power of the loss, that acknowledge the fact that things have fundamentally changed. The person has made a transition from living to no longer living. The survivor has now become, uh, entered the status of mourning, of a mourner. And the rituals that we have are important ways to acknowledge that shift, but to do it in a way that also says, yeah, things have changed, but we still love you. We still care about you. You're still part of our community. And now those rituals have been shaken just as people need them the most. So we need to be coming up with, I think, in creative ways, new rituals, rituals for the times. And there, and we see examples of that. We see in New York City, um, at seven o'clock at PM, every night people stand, open their windows and they start applauding for people who are doing all this healthcare work. I suspect we're gonna need rituals as well uh, once the, 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 the the most acute period of the virus has passed that can help people gather again and to mem memorialize their losses and to acknowledge the powerful transformations that they're experiencing in their lives and to acknowledge their grief. Uh, so Ken, I, I wonder if there's, is there a connection between these rituals or spirituality more broadly and the immune system? Great question. Um, we know that people who are more religiously involved, particularly in terms of attendance at congregations, tend to live longer. It's not, I shouldn't say tend to. I mean, the, the effect is much stronger for white Americans. It's about 14 year increase in life expectancy. For Af I'm sorry, for white uh, Americans, it's a seven year increase in life expectancy. And for African Americans, it's about 14 years increase in life expectancy. Uh, the question is, what accounts for that? And there's some emerging evidence that religious involvement may in fact uh, lead to some improvements in immune system functioning. I suspect that rituals may be part of that, but we don't know for sure. How important is the, the characteristic, I've, I'm told that you wrote a, a paper called Decoding the Human Spirit. Can you, what, what did that mean? Yeah, that was with Ryan uh, Nemec and, uh, um, and Panini at Russo Netzer. The, the point that this paper makes is that there's a close connection, an intimate connection between spirituality and, and strength of character, between spirituality and virtues, and that they in fact can facilitate each other. So spirituality is, is really a, a way, I think, of in part offering people a kind of a roadmap to live by the virtues of compassion and love and forgiveness and humility. All of these um, virtues and character strengths are, are encouraged by spirituality, but it's also the case that the character strengths can foster spirituality. So for instance, the character strength of perseverance can encourage people to stick with your religious practices because if you don't stick with them, then you don't gain the benefit of them. So the point is, is that there's an intimate connection between character strengths and spirituality. Are you, uh, when you see all around you, uh, knowing your personality and your feelings about this, are you optimistic generally or pessimistic? Uh, Edward Bennett Williams, the great lawyer, passed away a while back. I asked him once if he was optimistic or pessimistic. And he said, of course I'm pessimistic, I'm smart. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> well, I tend to be more on the pessimistic side. I have to admit that. And that's one of the reasons I was personally attracted to religion and spirituality as a kind of therapy for my own <laughs> pessimistic side. And one of the things I do take from spirituality is that um, pain and suffering don't have to have the last word, that even in the last moments of our lives, there are opportunities for sacred moments. There are opportunities for love and caring and compassion. And there are ways of extending our lives, not necessarily through a life after death, if you don't believe that, but I, I do believe we pass things on through loving deeds and caring actions 
to shape the world and affect our families, our children, and the people around us. And I think that's a, uh, there's an optimistic message in that. What do you say to people who, what advice do you give to people who want to practice spirituality during these times? Well, there are a number of resources that you can look at online. Um, resources that really offer some, I think, valuable tips for engaging in practices that you're comfortable with because there are so many practices and they're designed to meet the needs of many different people. Some people aren't comfortable with prayer. Some people aren't comfortable with meditation. Many people might prefer the notion of um, simply reflecting or taking a walk outside and appreciating the wonders of nature. So I would encourage you to look online for resources about the full range of spiritual pathways that you can take to feel a deeper connection with something deeper, something larger, something sacred in your own life. So Ken, can you say something about how that process, as we uh, are able to find these connections with something deeper, as you were saying, how can that change our perspective of what the world is like as a whole or of the meaning of the particular difficulties that we may be undergoing? Well, uh, maybe I can give you a, a clinical example. Uh, and I think you've heard this story from me, James, of the story of Alice. Oh, but, I love that story. Yeah. Well, I saw Alice many years ago in, in therapy and she had been dealing with bipolar illness for a number of years. She was in her 40s, and she hadn't found any real stability in her life. She was a delightful woman, but she, her life was a roller coaster of, of moods. And um, she needed to be hospitalized several times a, a year. And when I started to work with her, I was no more helpful than anyone else had been. Um, but one day she came into my office, and she was feeling very bleak. She was feeling suicidal. And I thought I would need to hospitalize her in feeling terrible that I wasn't able to really help her. And at one point in her um, crying and tears, she said, when will my suffering end? And it struck me as a uh, almost a biblical lamentation. And I said, Alice, where do you turn to for solace in your suffering? And she said, she hesitated. And then she said, well, I haven't spoken to anyone about this, but when I was first hospitalized, you know, I was about 13 or 14, and they had me in the, the room, she called it the rubber room, because it was um, protecting her from hurting herself. And she was in restraints to keep her from hurting herself. And she said that she had felt this sense of warmth spreading through her body. And I, I said, Alice, what, what was that? She said, I don't know, it just kept spreading through my body. And I said, um, and what happened, Alice? And she said, well, then the warmth spoke to me. And I said, Alice, who was, what, what, did the, what did the voice say? And she said, well, the voice said, I'm with you, I'll always be with you. I said, wow, who was talking to you, Alice? And she said, oh, that was God. God was telling me that he'd be with me no matter what. I was really struck by that. And I said, have you had that experience since? And she says, oh yeah, I've had that experience. You know, when I feel like I'm really at the end of my rope, then sometimes I feel like God is with me. Well, what struck me about that was that here Alice had this tremendous resource, her sense of spiritual connection, that was in fact helping her stay alive. Uh, in our conversations, she had stopped crying. And she felt well enough that she didn't need to go to the hospital. Well, that changed the whole focus of our therapy. And I began to focus much more on how could she cultivate that spiritual connection she could feel. And it turns out that Alice was a very um, gifted writer, even though she hadn't graduated from high school. And over the course of the next years, she began to write more and more. And um, I think that cultivated spiritual strength, helped keep her out of the hospital for 10 years. She's now in a nursing home, uh, unfortunately, dealing with a, an illness. But she still writes, and she still sends me her poetry. And it's wonderfully inspirational. And it's, it's, it's I think, a wonderful example of 
how people can cultivate their inherent spiritual potential for their health and well-being and that of others too because their poetry is really inspirational. Ken, uh, my final question is, do you uh, ever doubt your spirituality? You know, Larry, I have questions that I've had from the beginning and I still have them. Um, struggles are part of my spirituality, I think, um, like <laughs> that of many people. I, I struggle with how to reconcile uh, any kind of belief in God with the suffering and the pain, um, the unfairness in the world, so yeah, I have lots of questions and lots of struggles, but they're, they're part of my life. And like the Kintsugi vase, I try to be, build wholeness around my questions and doubts and my wounds and my scars. And it's always a work in progress. It's always a work in progress. The great screenwriter, William Goldman, passed away recently. He wrote Butch Cassidy in you know, fine movies. And yeah. he says there's three words that enable his whole life. Nobody knows anything. <laughs> We're all just grasping at air. Yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of like the, uh, the last words of the book uh, by um, Anthony Boyd. The book's called Daily Afflictions. And the last sentence in his book is, I'm one with the universe and it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> what a bright note to end on. Thank you so much, Ken. <laughs> Thank welcome. you, Ken. You're welcome. We're back after the show and just some follow-up that I have with, uh, with Ken is I, I can't make the leap into spirituality. I don't consider myself spiritual at all. You know, what is, is. Uh, I, it's kind of bleak, maybe. I think you're born, you live, you die. You do the best you can to lead a moral life. But that moral doesn't have to be subjected to what a book in the Bible says. Most of the, I, most of the moral people I know don't believe, and a lot of the worst are believers. And I see so much hypocrisy in religion. Uh, I've interviewed all the great religious leaders, and I've, I've never gotten good answers. I, uh, what, what, if, if there's a God, why couldn't he stop the Holocaust? Why, why didn't he? It, just, it makes no sense to me. And I've never gotten a good answer, except we do not question the ways of the Lord. I'm not satisfied with that. So to me, it's been a wrestle. I'm 86 years old. I've had every known disease. I'm still hanging around. I'm playing with house money, as they say. But, but I don't believe any God is, is guiding me. You, wanna, you have thoughts on that? I sure do. I sure do, Larry. First of all, thanks for that candor. I think there are a lot of people watching uh, who may feel that way as well. And I think one of the powerful pieces of Ken's message, to my mind, is that that's okay. There are some people for whom spirituality is in the context of religion, and that's okay. And there are some people for whom spirituality is outside of the context of religion. And I think his point is that spirituality can be thought of as whatever is of ultimate value for you or whatever is something really special at the depths of who you are. Now, I've seen your face light up in the middle of an interview. And my guess is that part of what is sacred or special or, or, or particularly meaningful for you is that space where you're, where you're asking those questions of another person. You feel that kind of connection and energy. Would you agree? Right. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think what Ken is, is tapping into is that kind of vitality and energy uh, doesn't have to have a theological also, description, right? But it's part so of who we it, are. Where does it yeah. come from? I don't know. Well, where. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm not sure where it comes mm -hmm. from either. I'm just glad that it comes, right? Hey, I thought it was a great session today. And I like Ken very much. And it's great working with you as always, Jim. Same here, Larry. So if I can just say a couple of things that, that our viewers might take away from this. Again, I think there's the, the connection between re religion and spirituality that is, uh, is possible, but it, it doesn't have to be there necessarily. 
And again, thinking about that search for the sacred. So what is it in each of our lives that we connect to as strongly as you, Larry, do with that process of interviewing and so forth? And, and Ken pointed out that this could be, a, there could be positives and negatives to this. So, you know, we don't want to have the view, you know, he quoted the, 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 the preacher who said that, you know, God is my sanitizer. Like that's not a, a, a good view to have in the middle of you know, coping with COVID. On the other hand, he talked about character strengths, things like awe or, um, uh, or gratitude, uh, things that we can, you know, the, these, these virtues that we can tap into that are fed by that sense of connection. When you feel that vitality, you feel that spirituality, it makes us want to be better people. And then just finally, uh, Larry, I'll talk about, you know, kintsugi. I think that's such a beautiful image that Ken talked to us about, where sometimes we think that the world has just been broken. It's just, it's, it's messed up. It, this whole coronavirus thing has just screwed everything up. Uh, and so whether it's, you know, personally or in our families or in our communities, things just are not going the way they're supposed to be going. And true, I mean, we can, who, can, who can say anything but, but, but agree with that? Except I think that one of the things Ken reminds us that spirituality can help us to do is to realize that sometimes even out of those broken pieces, things can come out of it that are incredibly beautiful. So rituals can help with this, um, asking questions and not shying away from them. Uh, can be really important in this process. So I guess my final challenge, Larry, to our viewers would just be to say, you know, what is, what is the place of that vitality? Um, and to, to, to be with it, even if things seem like they're going wrong. And I'm sure, Larry, in your career, you've had interviews that at some points have seemed like they've gone off the rails or something, uh, but you've been able to find in the midst of that, in the middle of that, you've been able to find that re-engagement with that vitality, that meaning, that mystery that is at the root of our lives and yet gives us so much hope and, uh, and strength to continue. Absolutely, great working with you as always, Jim. Same here, Larry, take good care, be well.